the key that I think I want to emphasize, nothing and nobody is trusted. Everybody has to explicitly ask for resources, show a validated identity, and then the system that is being asked to grant access is going to validate it based upon the shown credentials and so forth. Hey, good news. We're back with another season of Armchair Architects as part of the Azure Essential Show. You asked for more and we're here to bring it. This season, we're talking about something on everybody's mind, which is security. And we're going to start in an interesting place. We're going to talk about zero trust architecture. So let's get to it. Let's talk to our architects. Well, hello, folks. It's great to see you. Here we are, beginning season five. Um, we have lots and lots to talk about about security. Um, I thought we'd start like at the end of the alphabet. I'd really like to talk about zero trust architectures, right? Because I've heard many ways to describe it and I don't know if I know one that I like. Can either of you sort of take like, what is it? Because we're going to talk about things again from the, the A and ZTA is the thing that we care about, the architecture part. So can you, can you give us a, from that perspective? The way I typically look at zero trust architecture is that it, it eliminates traditional security boundaries or perimeters. And it assumes that no user, no device or workload is inherently trusted. And what that means is instead it accesses, it grants access to systems and data based on the multiple dimensions, uh, identity verification, device health, continuous monitoring, and least privileged access to the source. And the key, the key that I think I want to emphasize on Eric's point is nothing and nobody is trusted. Everybody has to explicitly ask for resources, show a validated identity, and then the system that is being asked to uh, grant access is going to validate it based upon the, the shown credentials and so forth. So I'll give you a concrete example at Microsoft, for example, if I want to use non cloud-based resources or protected resources that are specifically set up. Even if I'm on the, my desktop in my Microsoft Office, I have to VPN in. Normally we don't for Office 365 and other cloud-based resources, but if there are resources that are um, specifically protected, uh, then I have to VPN in, although I sit on the Microsoft fixed network in the Microsoft Office. That's what zero trust means for us. And, and it's not like, so So we need to be clear about this, right? When we say zero trust, we're not saying like you're never trusted. It's you do the right the right magical incantations. You set up the right things in the ways that we determine is the way to determine who you are and that you are who you are and that you should be doing this and that you're doing it from the right place and it's the right time and that sort of stuff. And then you're now in a trusted place. And I have to presume that that trust is ephemeral right because it's not like you do it once on the device and congratulations i now you know stamp you cool right it goes away i mean like how when you're thinking of an architecture like this how how do you think about an architecture that is sometimes trusted because that's really what's going on here right so we've all heard that term uh that, that phrase trust but verify uh, yeah. i think maybe zta is more like trust comes through continuous verification uh, and that includes like device posture, whether or not your device has meets a, a certain element of policy associated with the apps from everything you have the apps installed to the version of the OS to your credentials, your identity credentials and to what resources that you're trying to access. So it's continuously verifying you uh, based on what you assert at the time of access to a specifically guarded resource. And, and and this is because we kind of recognize just the why here, right? Is we recognize there's kind of different vectors, right? One of them is if, you're, if your laptop gets popped or somebody manages to get on your laptop, I can't trust that device a priori. So you have to make sure it's in a trusted state also, right? Then there's the human. And then it's probably not so great if you appear on two separate continents within five minutes of each other. Right. Like there's there's all there's there's also the where you're coming from context. Right. And and and, um, and so for me, it's just super interesting that, uh, you know, you first have to determine like how. So as an architect, how do you come up with the, the criteria? Let's start there. 
Well, I think that there's a lot of criteria that's already specified because these things are established solutions, right? So you typically okay. don't want to go, I can't imagine that you would want to go and kind of create your own zero trust architecture. You would want to certainly make sure that you apply it uh, specifically with like commoditized vendors like through Microsoft and uh, Okta and others to your, you know, your cloud or your uh, organization. Um, but ultimately, like from an architecture perspective, there are some key considerations that I think of, um, you know, and really I'm thinking about like evaluating network performance, um, frequent authentication requests and continuous monitoring means that there's going to be an overhead on the network. And so now we're going to have to get smarter about how traffic is routed across all these software defined networks, especially if you're in a hybrid situation or you're going to the cloud. Um, there's also being bring your own device considerations, which is, does everybody have a corporate device or does everybody have their own personal device? And how can I use technologies like Intune and others to kind of just provision that device, leave it personal, but also say that, hey, you got to have uh, iOS 18.3 in order to access this. Uh, so and then there's would, like legacy system constraints as well. Yeah, so I would add, let's start with the basics. I think you're already at the advanced stage, Eric, with uh, devices. And yeah, we do things. that. Yeah. Um, so, but if you think about it, the, at the core of a zero trust architecture is that everything has to have an identity. Everything, uh, every resource, every application, every user, every device, whatever it is, if it doesn't have an identity, it cannot participate in a zero trust architecture because we don't know who or what you are. We will not grant you access. I think that's the key one. Again, you mentioned um, Entra ID or Okta or similar. Uh, that's something that I think uh, is very important to think through. Once you have that identity strategy, and again, in certain areas, that's much harder uh, than in the IT world, for example, that's becoming the norm. But in the OT world, operational technology like factories or other assets, that's not the norm. So you have to think through what, how do you get to an, a zero trust architecture in uh, the environments that you have to manage. And once you have the zero, the identity model, you need to then say, okay, how do we enforce the identity? And obviously, again, rely on established providers to do that and don't build your own identity because uh, that's just not very good, scalable security and stuff like that. Identity is very sensitive. Then you have to go into the uh, scenarios that Eric points out, but I want to talk specifically about uh, application developers. Because okay. obviously when you build applications, you're part of a zero trust network, meaning your own application has to have identity. Uh, that's why we have service identity, managed identities, those kind of concepts uh, in various cloud providers. And when you access resources, you have to present either your own identity as a application, or you act on the behalf of the user to the resources you want to access, like storage or databases or whatever you might need in order to fulfill your application functionality. And that's another big shift from where a lot of people are with respect to application development and how to think about resources. There's a lot of trust bubbles being built. In this case, we are saying there are no trust bubbles. An application has to prove itself every time it wants to access the network. It wants to access whatever resources uh, they wanna have. And I think that's a big shift that a lot of uh, people should think through when they're building applications. And again, nothing new, uh, but certainly becoming heightened with respect to the um, security posture that a lot of companies have to adopt now simply because of the nationwide threats and other things uh, that are just becoming uh, the norm uh, rather than the exception. Yeah, you're you're taking me in a couple of different directions. And I was thinking about like, you know, identity over like your IP address is not a good identity, right? Like, like which is what used to be the case, right? When we were all used to firewall, it used to be like, cool, give me your IP and hope it hope it's stable for you know. It was never a good idea, David. Never. Yeah, okay, fair enough. It's never a good idea, but IP it is address um, so so easily. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and I'm also thinking about the fact that you're also bringing up like in the architectures that we build today where multiple resources talk to other resources. My app service talks to my storage, my this talks to that, then, you know, you have these identities and you need the, the, the resources themselves to pass identity between them. Okay, so let's pause this conversation right here because we're about to talk about a really interesting topic, which is how do these trust models change how we build applications? So join us in part two. Thank you.